Hey guys, it's Marcus here from TalkSober.com. And again, I'm not a doctor or trained professional, so any advice you take from these, make sure you consult with your doctor first. But what I'd like to do today is answer the big question that I get asked often. Marcus, why can't I stop drinking? And to answer this question, we are going to old Mick Pavlov's farm. Now, there was a little scientist dude, I don't know if he was a little or not, but his name was Pavlov and he tried this experiment with his dogs. And since I couldn't find a picture of a bunch of dogs, we got a bunch of dogs and a cat and a bird. So here is Pavlov and he's got his dogs and he's got his bell. Now what Pavlov did is he said, well, I wonder what would happen if instead of just throwing steaks at the dog when they're hungry, what if I was to ring the bell and then when the dogs would come running, then I'd give them a steak. And over time, old Pavlov noticed that uh, all he had to do was ring his bell. He didn't even have to have steak or anything, or even the smell of steak or steak anywhere on his property. And just by ringing the bell, those dogs would come ready to eat and super hungry. And he noticed that over time, what would happen is he just had to ring the bell and they'd start drooling and getting all hungry and wagging and doing whatever dogs do. They could be out there just, you know, roaming in the field. Bam, he rings the bell they're ready to eat. And what was happening here is there was a command getting embedded in the brain. And he noticed that as the brain would learn, it would get zapped by these commands. So it'd be like a little bolt of lightning saying, ding, 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 that means food. Ding, 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 that means food. Ding, 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 that means food. And over and over, it would embed this command with the salivating and the hyperness and the desire for food. So they'd get hungry even if they just ate. So he noticed that this started to happen and it started to put an imprint on the brain. Now there's two things going on here in what we call conditioning. You see these dogs were conditioned by the ringing of the bell to desire something which was the, which was the food. So in the conditioning what was happening is first you have what's called the trigger. The trigger is the event. The trigger is the ringing of the bell or something like that. And the event was, hey, I'm gonna be hungry or I'm gonna get fed or something like that. It's much the same way that things happen in our own life. Except rather than something as simple as a bell and something as simple as food, it might be deeply embedded things. For example, when I was a kid, I used to get yelled at often by uh, one of my step parents and it scared the tar out of me and it was very threatening and you know I went through all kinds of abuse and things like that uh, but what would happen here is I would get yelled at and when you're a kid and you get yelled at it's a traumatic experience that's why child abuse is called child abuse because it abuses kids and produces all kinds of bad things but what would happen as a traumatized kid is you would look at and it was much worse than yelling so I don't get any backlash the yelling isn't you know, the only thing there. But at any rate, um, what would happen is when you're traumatized, things get ingrained in your brain. Have you ever noticed how when something happens, either you're really afraid or really scared, things are really vivid, right? You remember the smell of something, you remember the taste of something, you remember the way things looked and sounded. Same thing happened when I was getting yelled at, right? I would look at the facial expressions. I would look for warning signs. I would embed the way something looked or the way a voice sounded. And all of these things went and put little zaps in my brain to watch out for. So now if I'm sitting there talking to someone who is not a threat, but they start to move their face in the way that that person did when they yelled at me, it would produce a result of fear or a result of I need to leave or something like that because these are all getting ingrained just like when the bell rang the dogs came for food even when there wasn't food same thing happened even though there wasn't a threat there I thought hey you know what there's danger going on now the same thing is happening with alcoholism and the craziest part about it is I don't have to get yelled at in the same exact way or anything like that. Just like Pavlov doesn't need to have food or a certain type of bell or anything or even a bell, just something that reminds them of a bell um, and it gets ingrained. Now, the crazy thing about this is it's not, it doesn't happen in words, right? It's not like you get yelled at, you say, gee, I'm getting yelled at, I need to feel this. No, it happens automatically, much in the same way that a computer's facial recognition software works. You see, facial recognition software 
works by analyzing the different parts of a face, whether the mouth turns down or the eyebrows turn up or whatever it is, that facial recognition software is looking for cues that reminds it of something in its database. And your brain all day is looking for things to remind it of other things in its database. Whether those things are triggers like fear or triggers like hungry or triggers like sadness or whatever it is, those triggers are bringing up events without words, right? So if someone turns their eyes a certain way and boom, you start to feel afraid. There's no explanation, there's nothing going on. And for me, what I would do is I wouldn't understand these, so I'd say, man, it's time to drink. We need to go drink, we need to shut these off, we need to get away with this feeling. Same thing with anxiety. Right, Your brain is working so fast, like that computer, scanning the room for anything and everything that could be a threat, and it's finding all sorts of things and producing an anxiety feeling in your body. Okay, And again, it's not like you're sitting there thinking, well, gee, that guy over there has green pants, and once a guy with green pants hit me over the head. No, it's not doing that. Right, It's something physiological. It's something in your body. All right, so now what's happening is you're getting conditioned, just like Pavlov's dog, that these need to produce this. It's kind of like an if-then, right? And your brain is getting zapped all over with these certain things saying this equals this, right? You see a guy throwing papers, you gotta watch out. You see, um, you know, whatever it is. You see a wolf in jeep's clothing, watch out for that. You see a two-headed guy, be afraid of him. You see a dog, you know, be afraid because you got bit by a dog when you were three or whatever it is, right? And all these things are building up in your mind and they build up over years and years and years. And when you're a kid, it starts to dig a little bit. Right? It digs a little hole and these things get ingrained. And when you become an adult, now you have all these things going deeper and deeper and deeper. And your brain is constantly going out there searching your environment for certain things, whether it's stress about money, whether it's an argument with the spouse, whether it's stress at work, whether you uh, hate driving in traffic because you get angry, or whether you like to have a drink after work to relax, right? What's happening is your brain is now saying, in order to relax, I now need this. That is why a lot of people call chemical dependency a disease, and that is why a lot of people believe that it actually changes your brain, right? There's a thing in brain science, if I want to sound very fancy, called neuroplasticity. And that means that your brain is like plastic. It's pliable, it's flexible, it changes, right? And what's happening is over time, all these triggers are happening. Now, when you have someone who is addicted to alcohol, chances are they are addicted because there are lots and lots of triggers, right? Just like how Pavlov's dogs were triggered to desire food at the ring of a bell, you are now triggered to desire alcohol for just about anything, right? I had social anxiety. You need that, you know, go drink. That helps for me until it stopped, right? And all these things happen and all these things happen and it's like your brain is there and it's got the antenna looking for things, looking for reasons to drink. And these things are so embedded and without words that it seems to come out of nowhere. And it's like your brain's going through the day and even when you want to quit drinking, something might produce a feeling, you don't even know how to explain the feeling, and boom, uh, hopefully the bullet goes there, right? Boom, the bullet hits you and it produces a trigger that says you need to drink. Um, and again, like if you watch my other videos with the stories, it's not like I was sitting there and I said, well, you know, we plunge the little plunger and boom, now we need to drink. No, not at all. Right? This stuff is happening behind the scenes. The dogs had no language to say, well, there's the bell. Gee, I think we better get hungry. Okay, So that's not what's going on. And you got to watch out for this because what's happening is you are now, in addition to all these triggers and all these things building up in your mind, you are now also controlled by the alcohol. Right? It's as if the alcohol, it actually quite literally, has hijacked your brain. And what is happening is now everything's triggering you and you feel like you need this to survive. So even when you do try to quit, even when you do try to do these things, these triggers are going on behind the scenes. And it's not like you're going crazy or anything like that. It's quite simply what happens to an alcoholic. This is natural. 
this happens, now it's time to get help before it gets worse, right? And I think that understanding your brain and understanding why these things are going on is going to help you because I want to let you in on a little secret. And that secret is that there is a bypass button, right? There's a bypass button. Once you know that this is happening, you can hit that bypass button to stop yourself in between cycles and stop yourself from drinking. Now, you might need help in the beginning. If you do, go to talksober.com slash help. We have tons of help available for you. But before your brain says, woo, we need to run and go get this drink, right? You can actually hit that bypass button and say, no, wait, this has got to stop. We need to intersect this. We need to pause for a while, right? This is what's going to break the shackles of addiction is being able to intercept and pause and stop because up until now chances are you've probably been living on autopilot or reactionary mode right you're reacting to things that happen to you as they come your way rather than stopping and responding right it's like someone starts to get mad at you like uh, this weekend was thanksgiving we went down to or went up to alabama for my family and uh, one of my relatives started in on something that could have easily thrown me off the edge. And, you know, three years ago when I was drinking, it would have been an all kind of fight, right? We would have been knocked down, drag them out. But this time what I did is I simply said, I'm not going to talk about this here, right? That was my ability to pause because three years ago, in order to get in that fight, I would have had to have a lot to drink. But now being sober, I'm able to interrupt those, right? And what's going to happen is as you start to push that button, right, that button's going to get in between you trying to dive into the drink and it's going to pause it and stop it. And it's going to start to zap your brain in new ways saying, you know what? I don't need this. There is another way. I don't need to have this to quiet my thoughts. I don't need to have to have this to calm my anxiety. I don't need to have to have this to relax or to work or to do whatever it is you think you need to do because you're going to start to pause it. Now, there's also an... Um, now, there's also another thing at play here uh, when you try to quit drinking, which is the whole detox. Now, in order to do detox, if you've been drinking a lot, you want to watch out for this. So I would advise you go to TalkSober.com help for tips on that as well. But what I wanted to do in this video is help you understand what's going on in your brain, help you understand that no, you're not going crazy. This is normal. It's how the brain works. And the best way to combat it is just to start watching what it does. You see, when I was drinking, I thought that I was my brain. I was my mind. I was my thoughts. But as I learned throughout the years of knowing that I'll be okay without drinking, I started to learn that that wasn't the truth, right? My thoughts and my mind are what my brain does, right? I am not the sum of my thoughts. I'm not the sum of the things that were done to me. I'm not the sum of the things that I do. I'm quite simply a human living through life, just like the rest of us. Welcome to the human condition, right? So instead of letting those dogs just run after whatever they want by being conditioned by damn near everything in your life, because over the years, let's face it, how many things have you made a trigger to go out and drink? Instead of doing that, let's start hitting that button. And if you need help detoxing or if it's your first time trying to quit, go to TalkSober.com help. Get the help you need. Subscribe to my channel. And uh, we're going to have some other videos for you to help yourself, to help others. And uh, so we can all live a sober life. Instead of reacting to life, start responding to life and being a part of it. So thanks again for watching. I am Marcus and this is TalkSober.com. I'll see you in the next video.